Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Our speaker today is Reverend Neil Curran. He is the associate pastor at Schofield Memorial Church. I remember when I first met Neil and Jody at a church, Fellowship Bible Church in Metairie, Louisiana, when he was first contemplating coming to Dallas Seminary. And then to watch God's work of grace in his life, not only in bringing him to Christ, but seeing him uh, migrate at uh, not your typical age uh, with a typical family, all the way to Dallas to uh, come through Dallas Theological Seminary. It's been a joy to watch God continue to develop this man. He had a career for over 20 years in the advertising and communications world of New York City, New Orleans, and Dallas. As a political consultant, he was uh, used in uh, over a hundred different elections. And at age 50, Neil and his wife Jody moved to Dallas to attend DTS. And after graduating 14 years ago, he became an associate pastor at Crossroads Bible Church in Louisville, and then has been named associate pastor at Schofield Memorial Church here in Dallas, where he has served for the last three years. He's authored uh, several booklets and books Uh, two of which he has with him today, Biblical Christianity for Catholics and Exploring the Basics of Biblical Christianity. There are some in the foyer and there are some up front. Uh, Unlike many, uh, he is not selling these. He's giving these away. Uh, What a gracious act on his part. Neil has brought a number of these and they are available to you and uh, you may pick them up afterwards. Neil has been married to Jody for 43 years. He looks it, she doesn't. (laughs) They have two children and three grandchildren. Uh, Their daughter Sheila is married to John and their uh, son Tom is married to Andrea, both of whom are here and both of whom are uh, alums of DTS. Uh, Jody, Tom, and Andrea, would you all, would you three stand so that we can recognize you today? Thank you. There is a delicate balance of heart that has to take place between the apologetics of our faith and the polemics of our faith, and especially as it relates to ministering to those and to have a ministry among those who uh, are in uh, other faiths or who have not yet come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Neil has the heart and the background to do both of those. And I'm sure part of his presentation will be a bit of his testimony of why he's doing what he's doing and why he's here this morning. But would you join me in welcoming our brother Neil Curran to our platform this morning. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bailey, Chaplain Bill. There you are, okay. I was honored and humbled when asked to uh, speak at chapel uh, and amazed. It's like speaking from the pulpit at Schofield Church where Schofield and Moody and Chafer have preached. How do they let me speak here? I used to sit in chapel and in class looking around at all these bright young faces and say, how did they ever let me into Dallas Seminary in the first place? Uh, But as one of our illustrious alumni, J. Vernon McGee, once said, before he got up to preach, if they knew me like I know me, they wouldn't listen to me. But then he remembered that if he knew them like they knew themselves, he wouldn't speak to them. (laughs) Seriously, it's it's a great privilege to be here. I think of this place, this great faculty, and and you all, chosen of God, I think of you all with great reverence and affection. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the great blessing and privilege we have all had to study your word here at Dallas Seminary and to draw close to you. Let your spirit guide us today as we look at effective and loving ways to share your timeless truths, especially with those coming from a Catholic background. We pray in the name of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you here today grew up in a Catholic family? Quite a bit. I grew up in a culture that was overwhelmingly Catholic in Holyoke, Massachusetts. 
It's called Little Kerry because so many families could trace our roots back one or two generations to County Kerry in Ireland. My grandmother spoke with a brogue and loved her Guinness stout. I could count the Protestants I knew on one hand. And I was a good Catholic. But I never heard the gospel. I never heard the gospel. Some people think Catholics are just another Christian denomination. Some people think Catholics are going to hell. By the way, if you use the words Roman Catholic, we immediately know you're a Protestant and we're suspicious. (laughs) Whatever you think, share the truth with all that you might win some. I was a good Catholic. As a teenager, I knew the rules and regulations and rituals the things you had to do and the things you could never do if you wanted to get to heaven. One of the rules was that you had to make your Easter duty. You had to go to communion on Easter Sunday. If you chose not to, it was a mortal sin. No problem for me, I took communion every Sunday, five years in a row. But there was another rule. You had to go to confession to a priest at least once a year. Well, leading up to this one Easter, I realized that I had not been to confession in a year. Again, not a big deal to me because I hadn't committed any of the biggies, you know, the mortal sins. Those are the ones that condemn you to hell. But here it was, Easter time. If I died on Friday, I was going to heaven. But if I didn't go to confession on Saturday, then I couldn't go to communion on Sunday. You know, if I died on Friday, I was going to heaven. If I died on Monday, I was going to hell. I no longer believed that to be true, and I thought if God was really that capricious, who needs him? I stopped being a Catholic that week. Now, I didn't go out looking for the truth because I didn't know there was any other. I had been taught that the Catholic Church was the one true church, that everything else was a counterfeit. I just did whatever I felt like doing. I maintained a reverence for Jesus, I knew a lot about him, but I didn't know him. It took about 20 years for me to hear and understand the gospel, the good news. Now I recognize that most Catholics, or lapsed Catholics, are pre-evangelized. They're like Jewish people in the first century. They know a lot about God without knowing him personally. Well, at age 37, I got saved at Fellowship Bible Church in New Orleans, not long after it was planted by another DTS alum, Weldon Buey. And then I became burdened to explain to family and friends what this biblical Christianity was all about. None of the literature I found could I give to an aunt or a friend. It all seemed very anti-Catholic, theologically sound, but like clanging cymbals without love for the people I wanted to share with. That's one of the things that led me to Dallas Seminary into writing up this little booklet that I could give to someone I cared about without offending them. You know, the truth comes packaged like bricks of information. If you toss them around, somebody's gonna get hurt. But if you wrap a brick in a pillow and you tie a big red bow around it, you can gently hand it to someone, someone who knows you care about them and they'll open it to see. To paraphrase C.K. Chesterton, you know, some scholars poke their heads up into heaven to see and understand all they can. But if you only try to fill your brain with the divine, your head will explode. The men who have gone before us, from Augustine to Luther and Calvin, to Moody and Schofield and Chafer, and all of the faculty at this wonderful place, these great teachers, they go a little higher up into heaven and they let the divine Jesus fill their hearts as well as their heads so they can share the truth and love and grace. Don't ever forget to do that. Well, I want to offer some of the things I've learned about sharing the good news with Catholics. There are several hundred of these booklets available for free. Take them with my compliments. I want to start by exploring the similarities and differences between biblical Christianity and Catholicism. Let's look at what we're doing as if we're looking at a tree. 
don't start by picking at the fruit of the tree. If you start by arguing about things like purgatory, or the checkered history of the popes, or praying to the saints or to Mary, the fruit of the system we call Roman Catholic, you'll waste a lot of time and make people defensive and argumentative, filled with emotion. Instead, go to the roots of the problem, where you have history and logic on your side. Concentrate on the root or the key issues. What's the basis for truth? How do you determine what's true? What or who is the real foundation of the church? How do you get to heaven? How do you get saved? Can you know for sure if you're saved? You know, first, how do you determine what's true? That's easy for us. We believe in the Word, don't we? Biblical Christianity says the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God is what determines truth. Thus saith the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Moses, Isaiah, Amos, all the Old Testament prophets throughout. And the prophet Jeremiah wrote, Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy that all scriptures God breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Most Catholics have not read the Bible. They're not exposed to it. Uh, now we believe the Bible is the final authority because it is God's word. The Catholic Church teaches something else. Now by the Catholic Church, I mean what people say at every Mass. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. One, unified under the Pope. Holy, all of the church and its teaching is directly from God. Catholic, universal, from the time of Christ. Apostolic, founded by and in a direct line of human succession of the apostles. Here's what the Catholic Church teaches about authority and the basis for determining what's true. This is the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church in the Second Vatican Council in 1963, published by the Church. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture make up a single sacred deposit of the Word of God, which is entrusted to the Church. The teachings of the Church are equal to the Bible. That's basically what it says. Uh, Hence, both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. The church has always regarded and continues to regard the scriptures taken together with sacred tradition as the supreme ruler of her faith. The leadership of the Catholic Church reserves the right to tell people what the Bible means. Now, which is more reliable, the Bible itself or tradition? There's a problem with the reliability of human transmission of information from person to person um, and from generation to generation. Things get changed. Try whispering an anecdote to someone sitting next to you in a room and have it go around the room. By the time it gets to the end, you're going to hear a whole different story, aren't you? Well, we know the Bible we have is the one written by the prophets and the apostles under the administration of the Holy Spirit. You know, no one doubts that Julius Caesar wrote his book about the Gallic Wars, yet the oldest copies that we have date from a thousand years after Caesar. And we only have about ten of those books of antiquity. But with the Bible, the last time I saw, we have over 24,000 old documents, old copies, manuscripts, some dating to within 200 years of the apostles. You probably know most of that. But we have far more verification than any other book of antiquity. A few years ago, Jody and I had the privilege of being in Ireland, and uh, we stood in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin looking at a piece of parchment under glass with part of the Gospel of John dated about 230 it's the same as what we have today. It's like having a letter from Abe Lincoln. You know, we know that it's authentic. 
And the archaeological discoveries of things like the city of Nineveh in 1870 authenticated what people had written off as a big fish story because no one knew where Nineveh was. There was no other record of it until it was dug up from under the sand. And the book of, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls have authenticated much of the Old Testament word for word. We can believe the Bible we have is authentic and reliable. Catholics do not know that. They're not taught that. I've heard it say by Catholics that the church wrote the Bible. Well, we know that's kind of true in a general way when we're talking about the church and, uh, as we understand it, but it wasn't the Roman Catholic Church that wrote the Bible. Another key issue for Catholics is who's the foundation of the church? Was P Peter really the first pope because he was handed the keys to the kingdom and the one on whom the church was built, as the Catholic Church teaches. As recorded in Matthew 16, when Jesus was asked, or when he asked the apostles, who do you say I am? Simon replied, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So Jesus renamed him Peter, a rock, and said, on this rock I will build my church. In English, it looks like it supports the Catholic position. But in the Greek, we see that Jesus is making a play on words. He's actually having fun. We call, he called him Peter, Petros. We might call him Rocky. It's a nickname. But Jesus said he would build his church on Petra, bedrock, the cornerstone. It's a whole different thing. God is the rock of ages. You know, Peter never claimed to be the rock on which the church was built. He always acknowledged that it was Jesus. In Acts 4.11, Peter quoted Psalm 118 saying, Jesus, the stone you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And a few verses later in Matthew 16, Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. It's obvious that Peter was not the final authority for matters of the church. The New Testament consistently declares that the power and the authority for salvation come through faith in Jesus alone and not through Peter or any succession or tradition of men. The power to forgive sins was not in the apostles' position, but in their message, the Bible. We believe in a succession of truth. That's a big difference. Another big issue, the third one, so how do you get to heaven? What's, what's this about salvation? The Council of Trent in 1545 was the Catholic Church's answer to the Protestant Reformation. The Council said, if anyone says that the sacraments are not necessary for salvation and that without them men obtain from God through faith alone the grace of justi justification, let him be anathema, let him be cursed, condemned to hell. In our lifetime, Pope John Paul said, man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1994, the first official catechism in 400 years, says the Roman Catholic Church is necessary for salvation. It also says salvation is obtained by cooperating with grace through faith good works, and participation in the sacraments. That's the teaching of the Catholic Church. We know what the Bible says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's the verse my dear wife came to faith in, and we shared with her. Also from John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let Catholics read the verses themselves. I'd even suggest that you get a Good News New Testament. They are available in Catholic bookstores with the official stamp of the Catholic Church. The fourth key issue in sharing with Catholics, I think, is eternal security and assurance of salvation. The Council of Trent said it is a sin, the sin of assumption, to actually believe you can know for sure you're going to heaven. What a tragedy. At, are there saved people in the Catholic Church? I think so. 
But at best, at best, they are robbed of assurance of knowing they're going to heaven. Of course, the Bible teaches eternal security and assurance of salvation. Learn the key verses. If you don't already know them, let a Catholic read them aloud with you. There are so many of them. I've put a few of them up there. Uh, You know, in John 10, Jesus said, My sheep recognize my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. So no one can take them from me. In Romans 8, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. Romans 8 continues, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? No. Well, you know those passages. If you don't, keep them with you. Underline them in your Bible when you're talking to to Catholics. John 5, 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the Son of God so you may know you have eternal life. I ask Catholics to read that and say, does that say that you may pray that you have eternal life, that you may hope that you have eternal life? No. It says you may know you have eternal life. This fills the longing of a seeking heart that we may know we have eternal life. There are some interesting points and key points in church history that most Catholics aren't aware of. Uh, Of course, the writing of the Old Testament. Their apocryphal books were written after that period in the Old Testament days. Um, the Apostle John probably finished the New Testament off around 96. The Council of Ephesus affirms Augustine's teaching that salvation is solely a gift from God that man is incapable of helping save himself. The Council of Orange, 100 years later, agreed with him. The doctrine of purgatory was first approved in 593. Prayers to saints and Mary were approved in 600. The title of pope was first accepted by Boniface III in 607. The College of Cardinals, which is the ruling body of the Catholic Church, wasn't established till the Middle Ages. I talk a little bit about the history of the church and how it got to be what it is in my booklet, so I hope you'll, you'll pick one of those up. The celibacy of priests wasn't required until 1079. The rosary wasn't accepted till 1090. Transubstantiation, the teaching of the church that the bread and the wine actually become the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the priest's hands. Um, of course, the Council of Trent, the tradition is equal to the Bible, The Immaculate Conception of Mary, not Jesus, of Mary, Mary's conception in the womb of her mother, said to be without sin. The infallibility of the Pope was declared in 1870. And did you know that the Catholic Church teaches that Mary never died, she ascended into heaven? 1950 is when the Church made that an official teaching of the Church. Most Catholics have no idea that that, that, this history, and it would shake them because they've been taught that the Catholic Church is the one true church and hasn't changed for 2,000 years, that Peter got it all. But it's not true. Most, most Catholics don't know that. Let me uh, conclude with some loving ideas and ways to share your faith with Catholics. Invite them to a beginner's Bible study on Jesus. Places like Stonecroft Ministries have great beginner Bible studies. Read John and Galatians and Hebrews with them. I know Hebrews was aimed at uh, the Judaizers, but they're so, the Roman Catholic Church is very much like they've added Christ to the Old Testament. And, and Hebrews really speaks, that it spoke to me the first time I studied it in Bible church. Share about the reliability of Scripture. Talk about the eternal security and assurance that people can have. Talk about having a personal relationship with God. It's not about a religion. 
That is very intriguing to Catholics. That's not the language they use. It explains saving faith, belief, trust, what that is. Faith is a religious word. I don't know what it means. Belief can mean lots of things. You know, I believe Queen Elizabeth's the Queen of England. That doesn't make me British. But trust, putting my trust in someone, I believe, you know, I understand what that means. Talk about having the resurrected new life, being born again, having the Holy Spirit living in you, your real life in Christ. It's intriguing, it's biblical, and they'll read those passages with you and be intrigued by them. Ask them to pray for God to reveal the truth to them. Most of all, love them. Just love them, love them. And don't give up. You know, after years of witnessing, I had the joy of leading my mother to a very clear understanding and a very clear expression of faith alone, in Christ alone, two weeks before she went to be with the Lord at age 83. I thank Dallas Seminary for giving me the words to do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace. Help us bring your love and your grace to those around us. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.